Hello guys, Winston here. I haven't gotten around to shooting my Rambone yet, but for this week's video I want to explain the process I used to mill out the layers of this slingshot. Using the freely available STL files from simpleshot.com and the program Meshcam, I was able to divide up this project into pieces my Shapeoko could manage. Before I dive into the details of this process, I want to address some of the comments from my earlier Rambone video. I do recognize that pine isn't the best material choice for a slingshot, but this is really just a proof of concept. That being said, with the precise material removal of a CNC and the smooth curves of the Rambone design, this slingshot handles loading reasonably well. The stress concentration factors aren't too large, so you can make the most of what little strength pine has. For a simple test that wouldn't result in wooden splinters flying at my face, I put a 15 pound static load on the forks. As you can see, nothing catastrophic happened. I would feel comfortable going up to 20 or even 25 pounds of draw weight on this slingshot. I also applied a few layers of spray lacquer to seal the wood and preserve the CNC tool marks, which I kinda like. I just need to find some leather to make a pouch and I'll be able to try it out. Back to the CNC stuff. Because the Rambone is around 5cm thick and I don't have an end mill with a longer cutting edge than 1 inch, I needed to machine the Rambone from 3 layers of 3 quarter inch stock. If you look closely at the STL, you can see how the file was designed with injection molding in mind. The maximum width of the Rambone tapers away from this parting line so that the two sides of a mold can pull away cleanly. This means that if I slice the STL file into thirds, I won't technically be able to machine every contour on the handle because the fattest part will overhang the bottom half of the middle layer. But in this case it doesn't really matter since a quick touch up with sandpaper will bring all the layers into alignment. Slicing the model into quarters is possible, but more trouble than it's worth. So, to get started in Meshcam, import the Rambone STL, making sure the model is laying flat. Use Meshcam's built-in slicer to generate three layers from this model. They'll be saved as separate STL files. Open up whichever one you want to start with. You may need to rotate the model about the X or Y axis in order to make it machinable. Once you're ready to go, Meshcam is actually pretty well streamlined for 3D workflows. Looking at the program sidebar, the first thing you'll want to do is define your stock. If you don't, Meshcam won't allow your cutter to leave the XYZ bounds of your piece, and that means you won't be able to fully separate it from your stock. Redefine your stock material to accommodate at least one end mill diameter on all sides of your project. You can keep everything centered on the X and Y axes. Since our stock material is slightly thicker than our Rambone layer, we'll also have to take that into account here. We'll need to input a material thickness of 0.75 inches, and also tell Meshcam we don't want any extra material left below our slingshot slice. Next, you'll want to define supports. Like the tabs in MakerCam I prattled on about last week, supports keep your workpiece from moving around at inopportune times. Just to make it easier for yourself later, you'll want to attach your supports to the bottom of the workpiece. That way, there's less material to trim away at the end. Moving down the row of options, you can specify a custom safety height for your job. 5mm seems like a nice round number to me, but if you want to clamp down your stock material between where the forks will be milled out, make sure you can clear your hold down fixture. Your spindle will eventually move between the forks. You have the option to redefine your origin, which I'm not going to bother with. I like starting out in the lower left hand corner of my stock material. Likewise, you can also specify a max cutting depth, which I'm fine ignoring too. The cutter is going to stop at the bottom of the Rambone slice, which we set to be coincident with the bottom of the stock material. The middle item on the bottom row of options allows you to specify a custom machining region. You can create an exclusion zone for your spindle or specify an extra area to mill out. We won't need to touch this either. The last step you'll want to do is to generate your toolpath. In the upper left hand corner of the window that pops up, select Machine Geometry plus Margin. This will keep material removal to a bare minimum. You'll want to specify a margin just larger than your cutter diameter. Next, selecting one of the end mills you've pre-programmed, plug in some reasonable feed rates and cutting parameters. On the right hand side of the window you can select different finishing strategies. I picked passes in the Y direction since that would maximize the cutter's time approaching the workpiece perpendicularly. Shallow angles of approach result in striations like you see at the top of my Rambone's fork. You can overcome this by doing passes in both the X and Y directions, but I didn't only because of the extra time penalty associated with doing so. Hit OK once everything's set and your toolpaths will be generated. You can see a preview of all of the cutting operations before saving. If you want to see the program's progress at any particular point in time, you'll have to use G-code previewers like OpenScam. Although this isn't a review of Meshcam by any means, I do want to say that the software is very good at what it's designed for, 3D milling. It's very powerful despite its basic appearance, but if all you want to do is 2.5D milling, then it's probably overkill. 
and in fact it may not give you the most optimized toolpads. Anyway, that's how you set up a slightly more than basic job in MeshCam. I hope some of you find this useful. If you have any questions, project suggestions, or requests, drop a comment down below and I'll do my best to answer them. I'm going to be at PAX East this weekend, so it may be a few days before I can respond. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back on the interwebs with a new video in around two weeks.